We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Ladies and gentlemen, free and independent. You're listening to Controversy Radio with your hosts, Jesse and Celicia. Hi, Layla. Hey. So welcome to Controversy Radio. I I know you have a very hectic schedule, so let's get right into it. Uh, My next guest is Layla Steinberg. Uh, You are best known as Tupac's first manager, writing coach, and mentor. Can you please tell the viewers how you first hooked up with Tupac back in 1988? I first hooked up with Tupac because I... I was really involved in, in the arts. I was an artist and an educator and did a lot of high school programs and assemblies and, and knew a lot of hip-hop artists. My husband was really active in, in hip-hop, and I wanted to find an artist to re- really be my partner, counterpart. Well, you you really hit the jackpot with Tupac. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was looking for him, and not, I didn't know who he was or... Or what that meant, but I just knew I was looking for a partner in in what I thought was probably one of the greatest educational tools and and the art that that had been musically. And, and so, yeah, another student of mine, Lawanda Hunter, kept telling me about a kid named Tupac and telling him that he should meet me. What was what was your relationship uh, with Afeni Shakur like? I didn't really have a relationship with Afeni at the time. She was his mom, and and like me, we had challenges with our family. And his mom was in a lot of pain, and and definitely was addicted at the time that I met Tupac, and and that probably is why I played the role I did at the time I did because anyone that's hurting or anyone that has challenges bonds with someone else that can relate and and we related on so many levels. Did you meet uh, Athene or speak to her after Tupac's death? After Tupac passed away? Yes. Yeah, I did. I actually, you know, I have deep love for Pac's entire family and when Pac died, I was so close to Pac. I was one of the people that always stayed connected to him. And so, you know, I mean, nobody had the pain that his mom had. She lost a son, but all of us that were grieving had a deep connection for sure. And I spent time with the family and did what I could to help organize some of the business that that he had dangling after he passed away. You know, a lot of us came together to help with Amy in the beginning. Tracy Robinson, who had a company with Tupac, Atron Gregory, who took over from, from me, um, Lisa Putnam, who really ran the company for years. I don't know, there's a lot of us. And we all came together with the family to help her in the beginning. And then, you know, estate lawyers and, and people who handled business for the estate took up over after that. Athene really pulled in people to handle his business that, that handle estate that didn't necessarily have relationships with Tupac. So D- after D- his passing, there's the business of death and the estate. And then there are family and then everybody else who loved him dearly so you know I don't think it's easy for a mother who lost her son to have to deal with mourning and grieving in front of the world absolutely it's always painful to see people that remind you of certain times in your life and at the end of the day no matter what I'm still a reminder of the most difficult time in a baby's life so Whatever love we have for each other and for whatever roles we play in one another's lives, I think that I was never an easy person to have to see. There was pain on all of our parts. Do you remember what your last conversation with Pac was? My last conversation with him was 
when he went to Vegas, when he got killed, it was Tracy's birthday. They were celebrating her birthday um, on the 7th in Las Vegas, the night of the fight, and I actually couldn't go. I wasn't well. So oh, I so you were, you were planning on going there? Yeah, I was supposed to go to celebrate. I wasn't going to go to the fight, but I was going to go out there and be with everyone. Were you aware that um, Snoop Dogg's cousin, Little Half Dead, was in the vehicle that shot up Tupac and Suge that night? Um, was I aware? No, I I really don't know the, all the facts of who was what and where. Okay. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's for sure. I've heard rumors, but I don't know. So I heard you're, you're being played by... Uh, Lauren Cohen, who plays Maggie in Walking Dead, is that true? It is. That's true. And when did that come about? Like when? Uh, when were? When did they approach you about this? They didn't approach me. I didn't have anything to do with the casting. Did anybody from the from uh, the biopic, like LT Hutton, contact you to give you a heads up as to that they were gonna play you in the movie and who was gonna play you? LT um, actually invited me to be involved. LT has always wanted to include me in the film, and and it's not because of LT that I wasn't involved. I really busy with the work I'm doing and it really it's it's very hard to include people that were there unless you're really going to give them a voice or some say so mm -hmm. and so there are a lot of us that, that are too close to the subject and so it becomes really difficult to include us because we all have our own agenda and it's too top story it's not my story I'm probably in there, like, all but the minutes on the screen. So I, I just, it was really a little difficult for me. I was touring with Earl. So I didn't go. And when you don't go, then you really don't get to give input. And, you know, I do appreciate that LT wanted to include me and that he reached out. And, and what I, I can say about this film because I, I did read the script, LT sent it to me, and it's a snapshot into Tupac's life. There's so much there that my hope is that people go and watch his story and watch what they did, and that that gives them the desire to do their due diligence and do their research and maybe find out some of the facts you asked me about today or that they go and, and do more research and understand the time period that Tupac came up in. You know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, Tupac will be one of the artists that really documented our time. And I actually believe uh, in a few years, Tupac will be put on a pedestal like a equivalent to Malcolm X or Martin Luther King just because of his political nature and the following he had. He... Absolutely, already um, is that to, to this generation. So I agree with you, and and I believe that you know it's important that there is a film because that will bring a new awareness and a new hunger to understand more. And you can't capture you know any of our greats in one film. This is really opening the door for a deeper conversation. And there's a reason that every Ivy League school in the country practically now is is offering courses on Tupac. That's and right. Arvon, and Elihu and I started the class at UC Berkeley on Tupac in the History Department. So, you know, that, that means something. The fact that, you know, a UC Berkeley or a Yale or a Stanford are addressing artists like Tupac and having intellectual dialogue. So were, were, when they approached you, was John Singleton still aboard this project or was that after he left? No, every time there's somebody new, they reached out, you know. So when it was Fuqua, you know, I connected with Fuqua. When it was Carl Franklin, I, I spent a little time with Carl. Um, when it was Singleton, same thing. So I've kind of connected a little bit with each evolution 
And the crazy thing is when it was finally time, I was traveling. And so I, I really wasn't able to be present. But Pop would have appreciated having LP, you know, be a black producer who brought on a black director. That was important to Tupac. He was truly before Black Lives Matter was a movement. That was his movement. You know, you could say Tupac really launched the Black Lives Matter movement because that's all he ever wanted to do was to help people examine on a deeper scale what it is to be a poor people, an oppressed people, a people whose lives didn't matter. And he was always bringing evidence and he always worked to diagnose the situation and the condition. And now it's our responsibility to take that diagnosis and really resolve these issues and, and be part of the solution and the change. Did you did you at any point uh, meet or speak to Mark Rose, the the original guy they hired to play Pac, who was also in uh, the NWA movie? Well, they never hired him to play Tupac. The only NDA I ever saw was for Darius. Um, he Love is, is the only person that was ever slated for that role for LT's film. And then time went on and things happened. And, and so they gave the role to somebody younger that ended up playing him. Uh, from, what, from what I came across, they were saying that uh, John Singleton... Uh, when he was uh, part of the project, he he personally picked out Mark Rose and was mentoring him to to be, to play the part. He he was never given an NDA and he was never given an MOU or anything. So so um, I don't know, but I know Gareth he Love is the only person that they actually had a commitment and gave something to. And then they ended up going with somebody else. So. so so Love was the first person they originally wanted to cast? Years ago. That was the first person LT actually was considering. And, you know, that it took a long time to make the movie. So what happens is you have an idea of what you want, and then all this time goes by, and then it doesn't necessarily work the way that you hoped it would work. Okay, so orig originally when uh, John Singleton was hired, both John Singleton and Mark Rose came out publicly and said that they both had um, approval and blessings of Afini Shakur to be part of this uh, project. And then I'm sure you're aware of uh, when John Singleton and Mark Rose decided to leave, they both had a two qu uh, Twitter comments about why they left? Well, as somebody who witnessed from a different place, I, I don't know that everything that people read is exactly what happens and keep emotions involved. And So uh, what, do you, you what do you think about John Singleton's accusations that uh, this biopic is disrespecting Tupac and Athene? Because even in his tweet, he was, he was uh, saying... How could you, how are you respecting Tupac's legacy when you just finished suing his mom? He didn't sue his mom. That's what people don't understand. They sued the estate. His mom was mourning her son. She was very minimally involved in the business. But she runs, son. she she is in charge of the but, estate, but right? That, that doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It really doesn't. And there are people who are making decisions for a Fanny. Well, that's what I'm telling you. As a mother who's also lost a, a child, you don't know until you have that kind of loss what it is. And so just because people run in a state and you think somebody is making conscious decisions does not mean they understand the full capacity I mean, I'm not going to be the one to explain everything. That's not this interview. But what I'm saying is, unless you really understand the inner workings, you know, maybe someone should do a research project on who is making decisions for the estate and who the people were that were involved when they decided to do a deal with Morgan Creek and then change their mind about the deal. 
there's been a lot of dysfunction in the handling of the Tupac Shakur estate, and it doesn't reflect his mother. It reflects what happens when you have that kind of loss and that kind of responsibility and that pain all combined and people who didn't even know Tupac make decisions for the estate. And so an, a, a deal was made that I had nothing to do with. Money yep. was paid, there that, was an agreement, and then somebody changed their mind. And so, so that deal that you're talking about, Morgan Creek is, is claiming that they have a contract with a Feeney signature on it. And they did. They did. She had but a lawyer, Feeney's... Dina LaPole. Dina LaPole did the deal. <laughs> I mean... But a Feeney's, uh, a Feeney's estate is, is accusing Morgan Creek of forging her signature on the contract. And they also uh, accused Morgan they Creek. They of, wouldn't have a, a film if she for if they had a forged signature. It's not true. That's why I'm saying I, I'm not doing an interview to dissect and analyze the dysfunction. But I'm telling you that would be a great research project for you. So as a reporter, as someone who does interviews, it would be great for you to do your homework. And and I'm not the one that going to be able to take you on that journey but i'm saying things are not always as they seem so from your pers and, from your perspective uh knowing what you know you don't believe that uh this film is going to be disrespecting tupac or his legacy or his mother i think that that from what i've seen that his mom will not be mad at what they did I think, although it's not the film I would have wanted, and I I can selfishly say that I spent years grinding and working with Pop when none of the people who make decisions now were around. And I did a lot more than an introduction. Like, I was very close to Tupac, and I worked really hard. And you won't see any of that in this film or any of the things I would have liked to see. So me personally, Layla, it's hard to see that, and it hurts. So I could tell you I feel disrespected. But the truth is, if I remove myself and I take my agenda out of it, and and I say, all right, did they do justice to his story? Well, I would have told a very different story. But they didn't do a bad film. They didn't disrespect the Faini. They handled very delicately the struggle of her family, of their addiction of Tupac's challenges, of his crappy choices, and his incredible passion. I think they did it, you know? I, I wanted to not like it because I wasn't involved and because I'm not that important in this film. But I can only be mad at myself because I haven't put my book out and I haven't shared my story. And I would also, you know, say in taking responsibility for not using my voice, nobody knows it exists. So I also say from a place of total love and respect to Afeni, she was a wounded, hurting mother who did not bring people to handle Tupac's business or estate well. And, and it hurts to see all these people that were close to Tupac, all these people who love him dearly, all fractured and severed and all hurting. And I would love to see a time and a place where all these people can actually come together. And I don't think it was ever going to be easy or okay for a family. She was never going to sit and want to supervise a film about her son. Like well, LT Hutton uh, made a comment in an interview saying that Afini had to approve and sign off o over every single decision that was made uh, regarding the biopic. So she was somewhat involved, right? What, what I'm saying is you don't have any children, right? No, I do. I have a nine-year-old. You have a nine-year-old. So if you lost your child, your only child, but your child belonged to the world and everybody had a piece of your child and had an agenda and wanted something with and for your child. And your child had a business that existed that had to continue and had to grow because your child was public and belonged to everyone. 
you would have people that handled your business that you trusted and they would come to you and they would say, sign this, sign that. I have artists who trust me and they trust me enough that they hope that I go over everything with them and I guide them and help them make good decisions. And so when you say something like a Faney looked at everything and had to sign everything, do you have That's according to L.C. Hutton. He, that was but out of his own mouth. That's my point. L.C. is telling you the facts. She might have signed everything, but you've got to disconnect somewhere. Like, you're not understanding, and I keep saying it. If you are dealing with something that's so painful you don't want to deal with it, you might approve everything. You might sign everything. You might look at everything. And you may not even be in the room because something happens inside of you. I just got through telling you I lost a child. I'm speaking from a place of knowing. And you often are sitting there in a room and you're doing what your people tell you, your lawyer, your assistant, and you're signing things and you don't even know what you're signing or approving. Do you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but according to Afini's lawyers, they actually said that Afini did not approve of this project and was actually disappointed with the way Morgan Creek handled everything. And even she's made a few quotes to, I, I don't have it in front of me, but she, according, like even the newspaper articles that we're reading that, were, that are coming up, all of them are insinuating that Athene did not approve of this project, and that's why she filed a counter lawsuit for $10 million okay. against Morgan so Creek. Okay, so how come, and all I'm saying, and I'm not part of Morgan Creek, I get nothing from this. I'm not part of the estate, I don't speak for Athene. So, I'm telling so you, as, as someone, someone who was... years of dysfunction, and who's witnessed years of one minute the estate does this move and then there's a new set of lawyers and they do another move. A Faney entrusted people to help them make decisions and then things changed and she changed her mind. I'm saying as someone who's in this business every day, this is what I do. And as someone who has had interactions with both sides for many years now, what I'm saying is when she first did a deal with Morgan Creek, there was a deal done, and then so so you're saying she did sign off, sign a contract then. I'm saying they wouldn't have been doing a film if there wasn't an initial agreement and something signed. So what I'm saying is remove a Faney and remove Morgan Creek and do your research on the real players and the real people making decisions, and you might find the answers that I can't give you. All I was doing was giving you some things to look at. As you want to analyze, dissect, put Morgan Creek on trial, put the estate on trial. You know what I'm saying? Like, everyone has something to say. And so people will take sides and they'll say, oh, F Morgan Creek because Afaney didn't want to do the deal. Well, all I'm saying is Afaney is a hurting mom who lost a child. She didn't want to do any deal. And as soon as something, you know, triggers something, it, it does something inside of us. And so in the beginning, there was some sort of a deal or there wouldn't have been a lawsuit. I'm just, I, I'm about to go teach a class with Professor Armour in the law department right now at USC. Yeah. All I'm saying is, as critical thinkers and, and people who are, you know, intellectuals and using language and doing our research, Look at the whole situation. Morgan Creek did not do the movie I wanted, nor that I would have done. I wasn't involved. But all I'm saying is, even if I didn't know Tupac, if I was going to report or look at something, I'd have to really look deeper and look at the whole picture. And, and I've had to do that. And believe me, my feelings are hurt. I would have liked to have had a voice. I would have liked them to include me. You know, I sacrificed so much. I lost so much in my commitment to these young voices that mean so much. And and I hurt, you know, differently than a Faney, but I'm still wounded and I'm still damaged. And with all that loss, like, it's a really important story to tell. So, again, it's on me. I have to tell my own story, and all of us do. And at the same time, I think it's a movie that 
So he did it, you know, he made it happen. So I'm not going to um, talk bad about him when I know what he went through to get this done. And many of the times he made changes, he did that to accommodate a fainty. Surely not me, or he's seen me having real tangible screen time, and I would have been out there. But I read the script. It didn't seem important at this juncture for me to take myself away from children and work. I couldn't afford it. You know, like I, I don't need to convince you. Like you know better than anybody. Tupac fans are one of the most loyal and hardcore fans uh, out there. So when somebody who is a Tupac fan sees a Feeney getting sued, and then a Feeney, a Feeney's lawyers having to file a ten million dollar counter lawsuit, and then you also see um, the next director that was hired, him filing a ten million dollar lawsuit. So it kind of makes people weary. Of, of the whole project and it makes them... it made me weary too which is why i'm telling you i felt the same way and then i had to grow up and really look and and it'd be interesting for somebody to really analyze how much the estate lawyers have made over the years and their role like i don't think a fanny knew half of what was going on because when you have that kind of loss you don't want to know and so i i'm just saying i think we need to Anybody who loves talk is somebody I have love for. It's the reason I'm doing your interview. I hate doing interviews. <laughs> you told me you love Tupac, and for that reason, I feel like maybe Tupac would have wanted me to to use my voice. And no, and I really respect you taking the time to talk to us. Uh, really appreciate it. And w what we're trying to do is is get to the bottom of it because we're hearing all these stories. We're reading hundreds of newspaper articles and stories are getting changed and there's a lot of controversy behind this film. Like, did you at any point discuss John Singleton leaving with John Singleton? Like, did you guys ever have a conversation about that? We did. We did. I've had a conversation with every single person that's left the film. And what did you guys discuss in that conversation? with? I what? can't tell you. <laughs> that's the stuff I can't tell you. But I respect John. I have love for John. And I know why John feels the way he does. And I know why Carl Franklin feels the way he does. And Carl's a friend of mine. It's been very, very difficult to watch all of this. So then you don't, you don't personally believe that John Singleton is lying then? I don't have an opinion about what he's saying, nor do I even have an opinion about LT. What I was expressing was from the most honest place I could be when I looked at all of this. I was honest with you when I told you I wasn't happy. My feelings are hurt. Like, so wh really, why weren't you happy? I'm really not that important. I'm just saying because if I was going to tell the story, I would focus on other aspects. Tupac is a massive story. And so me, I want you to understand this young poet that I worked with, that I hit the pavement running with. I want you to understand us as young adults and teenagers that believe we could conquer and change the world against all odds. I want you to know I'm not the older 35-year-old white woman they portray in the movie <laughs> that was the white savior of Tupac. I was a young woman, a mixed woman of So color. did you discuss that? I, I want you to understand that I was his peer. I was a young person of color fighting for oppressed people like Tupac. I was no white savior. He was my savior. He discovered me. I was an artist who Tupac believed was also a businesswoman that could be super powerful. And it took Tupac to help me have enough esteem to fight for him and me. And so what I'm saying is that's the story I would want people to know. I would want to reverse the story that people think. And so... You can't imagine how hard it is for me to watch the story that gets told. And I was the introduction. No, I wasn't the introduction. I was the peer who sparred with him, who wrote with him, who rapped with him, who did everything I could to help him be his best before we delivered him to the world. That counts for something. But I'm also a grown-up, and I'm also honest with myself. And I say, damn, Layla. You didn't put your story out there. You haven't released your book. They don't know. So be mad at yourself. And don't be mad at LT that as a young black man, he too fought for his dream of being a producer, a writer, 
and he did what he knew and what he could. And so I'm working to be objective as I do this interview and give you the whole picture and tell all of you and anyone listening that before we're always so quick to judge and criticize others, let's get the whole picture. Let's understand 20 years of pain and a legacy that's so complicated and trace the people who were involved in every step of the way, trace the decision makers behind who were supposed to be the decision makers, trace the few people who were there every step of the way in all of those decisions. And in doing that, you might find your answer. And you might understand how this mess turned into what it is. And anybody with that kind of brilliance and that heart and that talent is going to have stuff all around them, like Tupac does, that it's dysfunctional, that forces us to work through stuff. And so that's just my thought. <laughs> and a lot, a lot of uh, Tupac fans' concerns around this biopic is the fact that it seems like they they will portray a Feeny, uh, sorry, Tupac in a bad light, like they will mainly focus on his gangster life and the fights. No, and they the... didn't do that at all. Okay. So so the script that you read, it didn't come off that way, that it's going to be like a, just a thug Not and no. that no. Tupac no, mistreated no, 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 some no, of his no. friends? Or... I, I saw the film. It is a snapshot into his entire life. That's what I'm saying. It touches on a bunch of different things. It, it's his journey. And what I think this film will do will open the doors for a bunch of, you know, other people to tell their stories. And for all of the different things this film touches on, we have the opportunity to go deeper. And and if that does that, if, that, if it sparks interest, if it invites audience and people who never knew or never were interested in him, and it did justice because it, it opened the door for deeper conversation and, and a longer legacy. And that's, you know, what we would want. So um, are you aware of um, uh, LAPD detective Russell Poole by any chance? Uh, just the name. Okay, so Russell Poole was the the LAPD homicide detective that was the first first on, on the scene when, oh, yeah. uh, when Biggie Smalls yeah. got murdered. Yeah. So he ended up working for for uh, Biggie's mother, who hired him to work as as a private detective for her, to figure out who ended up killing her son. So while he was doing his research, and Russell Poole's actually confirmed this before he passed away, that um, not only the LAPD was involved in both uh, Biggie and Tupac's murder, but that they helped cover it up. And there was a lot of crooked cops that were involved. So Russell Poole came across evidence that Snoop Dogg's cousin, who is known as Little Half Dead, was in the car that shot Tupac and and Suge Knight in Las Vegas. Being like you're, that you were so close to Tupac and hearing that Snoop's cousin was one of the people in the vehicle that shot Pac. I don't have any um, any comments on that or anything around that. The only um, thing I could say is that in my lesson with Tupac, if anything, I would have worked to help him not seek death, not see death, and, and to reframe his thinking so he could see himself living to enjoy his work. And so what I know is Whoever did it, whoever was there, it was coming. He saw it coming, and he told all of us at 16 and 17 that he would die by the time he was 25. And when you continue to speak that and see it, you bring it. And it doesn't really matter where it comes from. It's coming. And he gave us all something to think about and learn from long before documentaries like The Secret came out. If you go to Tupac and understand the power of one's thought and one's voice and have an opportunity to, to change that. So do you think he attracted it by, by talking about it? Saying, him seeing it and him speaking it on a regular basis. You know, nature teaches us that the more we visualize and the more we see things, we bring them into our lives. And, and I witnessed it, you know, multiple times. 
and he brought everything he said he was going to bring. If you watch that film when he's talking at 17 with his teacher yeah, yeah. on the lens, he tells you he'd be one of the most studied, studied rappers of his generation. He would get Absolutely. caught up in prison and he would die at 25. So I'm saying more importantly than Lil Hassid being in a car is the understanding of how powerful we are and how powerful our thoughts are and how powerful Tupac was. And had he been able to, to change his trajectory, he would still be with us today. And, and that would be much more important for us to talk about. Than well, it just makes people weary when, when somebody like Snoop uh, his cousin being in the car and then all the interviews that he's uh, done after Tupac's death. One minute he'll say he loved Pac and they were best friends and then the next minute he says that uh, Tupac was bad for hip hop and that uh, him and Pac didn't get along and they didn't like each other. So that well, makes Tupac people... Tupac was a Gemini and people felt that way a lot. He confused people. Tupac was conflicted, you know? He was a kid. He was growing up. He was so passionate and so driven. But he often was in his own internal struggle. How do you serve those that are are from the streets? You know, how do you help and heal and make a difference? And how do you become what you want to save so that those you want to help listen to you without getting sucked into the energy of what you become in order to make a difference. I mean, it, it's pretty deep, you know? It, there's a lot to think about when we sit in judgment of people and their thoughts. And Snoop had a lot of reasons to feel that way. Did you hear about how Tupac uh, scrapped one of his albums and then uh, later on Snoop and the uh, members of the Dog Pound uh, took that album and pretty much copied uh, all that for shizzle, my nizzle stuff? Snoop used to say that he actually took that from Pac. And there's uh, interviews where uh, some of Tupac's friends are talking about the fact that Tupac found out that uh, people like Snoop and other individuals were stealing his style from that album that he was going to drop. And then he had to cancel it. And then you see right after Pac dies, Snoop comes out with his own version of that album saying for shizzle my nizzle. All of this stuff was all stolen from Tupac and that kind of, that really bugged some of the real hardcore Tupac fans out there who don't appreciate the two-faced people that were around Pac. I mean, you know, all my loved ones that struggle with those same issues, I think that, you know, I mean, it's hard. So you mentioned um, in your previous interviews, like in Soggy Angel, which I really loved, that I was the biggest uh, Tupac fan after that documentary. Uh, you mentioned that you, uh, you and Pac read a lot of books together. I, it's funny because I actually just brought my entire library over to Earl's studio because he has all these bookshelves. So I just brought like hundreds and hundreds of books over there. It's pretty cool to see him again. Because they've been in boxes for a minute. I've moved Must so bring much. back memories. Oh my gosh, it's funny that you're asking because we've been looking at my bookshelves for days. But, um, God, I mean, we read so many books together. I don't know. I know if you watched the documentary, you saw a lot of my books. What, what kind of projects are you up to now yourself? Uh, are, you have signed another artist? I, I manage your own sweatshirt. I'm, um... I have a couple artists that are awesome that I'm working with, some new artists and a few artists that people know, but Earl is the main artist I'm working with right now, and, and I'm doing a lot of work at USC with Professor Armour in the law department. I have my nonprofit, aimfortheheart.org, and I still teach the mic sessions every week for artists from all over. They come just like the workshop we did in my living room 25 years ago. They could just go to the website, send an email, and they'll be able to reach me. Awesome. You and Tupac used to freestyle together? I mean, we all wrote together. I was never going to be a rapper, but when we all wrote, and okay. there's people all around me while I talk to you. So I'll you're be embarrassed if I bust up. <laughs> That, that I would I would actually love to hear that if, if I if I call you back later would you be able to give us yeah some... if you call me later I'll do something from that time here. awesome I'm sure that Tupac fans would love to hear that thanks for your time I really appreciate this interview and 
hopefully we can speak a bit, a bit more a little bit later on today. I know you're busy and yeah, you got you a class to teach. Later. Thanks for the interview. I hope it was okay. That, no, it was awesome. Thank you very much. And the reason we wanted to talk to you was just your passion and love for Tupac. That's why we reached out to you uh, over anybody else. And we really wanted to get your opinion because you can hear it in your voice that uh, you just have pure love for Tupac. And so that's why we wanted to talk to you and uh, kind of get your opinion on some of the stuff that's been going on because uh there's a lot of controversy around this uh, biopic, and Tupac was known know. for being surrounded by controversy, so I guess it only makes sense. It's true. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, my God. Sorry, I had an interview, and I said I do. And now I'm worried I'm not going to make my class on time. I have to be at USC by 6 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, free and independent. You're listening to Controversy Radio with your hosts, Jesse and Salisha.